This video was originally recorded at the Force for Good class series at Tibet House, New York in February 2018. To learn more about this ongoing series happening at Tibet House and online, please visit tibethouse.us. The words particularly, but some of the meanings. And uh, when it was published uh, in the 70s, I guess, I, uh, I gave a copy to my teacher, a Mongolian Lama, Geshe Wangel, who was semi retired by then. And um, he was in his 70s. And um, I said, here, Geshe, I know you don't read this kind of English translations. You know, you have the Tibetan, but uh, maybe you can put it in the library of the monastery where he was. And uh, he said, oh, you're beginning to study that. <laughs> and I said, no, no, I translated it. And, I, and I, yes, he said, you're beginning to study it. And then I again, I stubbornly repeated, I said, no, no, but I translated it. And he said, yes, you're beginning to study it. And I, <laughs> then I gave up, I quit. <laughs> and of course, he was absolutely right. You know, over the years, I must have read it uh, 50, 50, 60, 80 times with students, and um, both in academia and, and in uh, settings like this, sort of. Um, and there's just so much more in it, you know. And it's so short, actually. It's, um, it's quite marvelous. And it's, uh, it's like an anthology of all the Mahayana Sutras. It has, like, elements from all of the huge. And Mahayana Sutras are enormous literature, really quite big. Um, maybe, like, 100, 100 Bibles or something. You know, if you print them, print, printed them all in small print, that's a big, huge uh, pile of them, and the kind of long, big Tibetan book with the big Tibetan letters. You know, it's a graphic printed book. And uh, that's warm tonight. I take off my jacket. So now we begin with the Vimalakirti. You know, I, I usually, beginning of a class here, we usually chant together the Heart Sutra. But we, they forgot to do it, so we won't do it tonight. How many of you know the Heart Sutra by heart? Anybody? <laughs> uh, hello. I know a few of you know it by heart. You want in, in in English or what? You know it by heart. Can you recite it then? <laughs> no. <laughs> it would be good to recite. Anyway, the thing about the Heart Sutra, the key thing about it. So we'll think about it. So, the key thing about the Heart Sutra is the emptiness is form, form is emptiness, uh, form is not other than emptiness, emptiness is not other than form. That's the key thing. And form means matter, you know. It doesn't just mean a shape. In a way, I don't like the translation of form. I always like to say emptiness is matter or voidness is matter. Matter is voidness. Because the key thing about emptiness is it's just the relativity of all the things. It isn't some space in which they are. Space can be an analogy for emptiness, but emptiness is not space. Emptiness is, um, space is also empty, you know. And, uh, and so emptiness means that no thing has intrinsic reality. Everything is empty of an in fixed intrinsic reality, which means everything is relative. And even and so and so the absolute is all of the relativity. So emptiness really is the Buddha's discovery of relativity. That's what it is. Long before dear Mr. Einstein. <laughs> so let's reflect on that for a minute before we begin. And then um, you can chant with me. Let's all chant a little bit. Since we don't have the whole text. Just to get in the mood for the class on Vimalakirti, let's start, let's go. Om, so repeat after me, okay? Om, Om. Gate, 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 Paragate, Parasamgate, Bodhi, Swaha, Om Gate Gate, Paragate, 
Parasamgate Bodhiswaha Om Gate Gate Paragate 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 Parasamgate Bodhiswaha Now all together, it's with me, not wait. Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasamgate Bodhiswaha Om Gate Gate Paragate Samgate Bodhiswaha Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasamgate Bodhiswaha That's great. That means, as you know, I think, does everybody know what that means? It's a man, it, that's the mantra of Prajna Paramita, which means transcendent wisdom. And uh, it is the mantra of, and she is a goddess, actually. She's a great mother of all Buddhas, they call her, Salavajina Mata, mother of all victors. And, um, but she also is reality. She's the reality of emptiness slash relativity. And the gate means gone. It's the past, passive participle of, of the verb to go. So gate means gone. So it's like saying gone, gone, very, uh, super gone. Paragate is really super gone. Super, totally gone. Enlightenment, all hail. That's what it literally means, that mantra. But it's a mantra, so it just evokes the sense of emptiness. And the emptiness doesn't mean nothingness. So, if you have an experience where you feel you disappear, it actually is a very important and powerful experience to sort of let go of yourself completely. But then the seeming sort of encounter, losing consciousness, let's say, or being as if everything is nothing or something, of course, is not an encounter with nothing because you can't encounter nothing <laughs> because it isn't there. <laughs> so when you have an experience of seeming unconsciousness, it's something you are projecting also. Just like when you have an experience of the wall, you have an idea of a wall, and your brain has a, has a concept for a wall, and it organizes the, the, the subatomic and atomic reactions in your optic nerve and your brain and everything into a perception of a wall. So in a way, you are sort of co-creating the wall in your perception. You know, you, with, you think you see the wall and it's self-evidently the wall and it sort of comes over to say, I'm a wall. But actually we're creating that as a wall. And if you're very drunk or something, you wouldn't know what it was, you know. <laughs> and when your brain is not doing that organizing, you know. And so similarly, when you have an experience of nothing, it's because you have an idea of nothing. And you have an idea of being unconscious. And so you think that's the absolute, that, which is the, that's the, the problem of materialists. They think that that sort of going unconscious is like going to be what death is, and that's what they're going to happen to them when they die. And they're going to, they're going to rest in nothingness. But that's a total delusion, because nothing means there is no nothing. Nothing is not there, so it's not a dark space. And that's not emptiness either. It's just our last sort of ditch, you know, projection, actually. The feeling of disappearing into nothing. That's kind of a projection. But that's a little hard to, I mean, you can get it logically, maybe, but maybe it's hard to grasp. But it's also very, very powerful. It's an important experience. Tsongkhapa, in one of his books, has a really marvelous thing that I didn't see anywhere else. He says that there's three types of mental habit perceptual habit. And one is a perceptual habit of something as being absolutely there. And there's a second one is a perceptual habit of not seeing anything there. Having that thing that would seem to be absolutely there, having it disappear. You can perceive, you can have an experience like that, seeing through thing. 
And the third one is uh, perceiving things without sort of noticing whether they're really there or not there, sort of unqualified as to existent or non-existent. And then this is very interesting. And then he says, the unenlightened person only has the first and the third of those perceptual habits. And the enlightened person has those same two perceptual habits, but adds the second one to it. So it means that, in, that, that experience of everything being nothing is a very powerful one, but it isn't the true state of affairs. But it's kind of a counter to the experience of everything as being absolutely there. So when you, since we have a habit of thinking that things are intrinsically or absolutely or objectively there, when we really focus deep down on them, we can have a mental experience like we were a cyclotron, you know, like an electron accelerator or something where it disappears. You definitely can have that experience. And, you have a, and some people think that's the experience of emptiness, but it isn't. It's an experience of sort of seeming disappearance, seeming annihilation. Actually, people are frightened of it. People will re recoil from that experience. But somehow, the, by having had that experience, one then when one sees the thing again, as if it was really there, but has once had an experience of it disappearing, its real thereness seems illusory. It has a kind of illusory quality, because you know if you press down on it, it will disappear, sort of thing. You follow me? So somehow then, enlightenment is somehow being able to encompass those two opposite things which seems impossible to us, of course, because we think it's either this or that. You know? But in, enlightenment is a, I call it sometimes, the ultimate tolerance of cognitive dissonance. <laughs> and then, if that seems to you completely impossible, then remember next last time you looked in a mirror. Then when you looked in the mirror, you saw something that had seemed to be really there. There's Bob Thurman in that mirror. Well, his left eye and his right eye have switched places, but otherwise, that's him there. And he's through that window, another guy like me. Like, we have a dog called Muki, Miko, and he will bark at himself, his reflection, he never stops. <laughs> he didn't figure it out. Somehow bumps into the glass and barks and barks. And he's really sweet, you know. The dumber he is, the sweeter he is. <laughs> but point is, we know that's an illusion that there's a three-dimensional person in there when we look in the mirror. Or even if we look in a rearview mirror and see, let's see a scene behind us in a car, we know that it's behind us. It's not, it's not through a window. We know that. And we don't have to think about it. So we see it as if it were there, and we interact with it when it's somewhere else. So we have... We have that cognitive dissonance is completely encompassed in that one cognition. Because we don't have to repeat the, the, the experience of reaching at the mirror and bumping into the surface and realizing it's just a reflection. Because we've had that experience. So it's something like that, this thing about the three perceptual habits of thereness and not thereness and then not qualifying. You know, when you see something in peripheral vision or something, an example of the not qualifying. You know, if I, I'm looking at you and I kind of am aware of the pillar out there or somewhere, but I don't kind of like it, get focused on it. It's just, a, it's, a, it's, not, it's in my perception, but it's not noticed, and therefore it's not qualified as being really there or not there. That's an example of that. So I'm, I'm launching right into, because we're doing Heart Sutra, right? So Heart Sutra just means that if you just remember from the very beginning that emptiness means infinite relativity is actually what it means. It's the discovery of relativity. It's not the discovery of a kind of deeper nothingness. It's infinite relativity. Then, you know, you will not be frightened if you have a, if you get, if you have an experience of empty, some kind of feeling of everything disappearing. <clears throat> and you will, you will maybe a little bit draw strength from the infinity of the universe, that you know anything is possible. You know, and the good, the positive ending, happy ending to history could be the case. You know, best of all possible worlds could be, even in spite of Mr. Voltaire, dear old Voltaire and his garden. 
best of all possible worlds could be the case. And therefore, we could have an ideal opportunity of life here in the kind of human being that we are to fully understand the nature of things. We really could. It's possible. We don't think so. We feel very frustrated with a lot of things we don't know. You know, we're like the way we are. But it's possible we could come to be free. And we also think we're resigned to thinking that that we're going to suffer and things are going to go wrong. Everybody's like half miserable. And I even, you know, people laugh when I say, but it's true. We're conditioned to think when we do for temporarily don't feel miserable, we feel really worried. <laughs> so when we feel a little bit happy and we're sort of, yeah, but really I'm miserable. When that feels, this makes us feel secure about being happy. <laughs> that it's only being reflected in the ongoing stream of our misery. So then we feel safe. We are kind of temporarily jolly, but we kind of don't notice. And we say, no, I'm really miserable. You know? It's not really good enough. Right? You look doubtful. <laughs> but you smile. I'm, I'm talking to my friend there. OK. I mean, you're all my friends, but that particularly, she knows what I'm talking about. OK. So <clears throat> that's the Heart Sutra. It's not, emptiness is not nothingness. And even there are people who go saying, I realized emptiness. And in a way, you can say that. But um, in a way, if you perceive, if you have an experience of empty space or something, that's not emptiness. Knocking on this tabletop is emptiness, just as much as an experience of empty space, really. And actually, it's almost knocking on the table is more challenging experience of emptiness. You know? Emptiness is a straight what they call an exclusion negation, an absolute negation. And so in a way, what emptiness means, where, how do you understand emptiness? When you're looking at the nature of things, and, you, and then you really look deeply and you drill down, as, as Bill Gates likes to say, used to like to say when he was running Microsoft, you drill down into a problem, you, know, you really focus deeply on the, looking into the nature of something. And then the thing in that, in, that, in that meditative thought experiment, that contemplative thought experiment, you actually don't see the thing anymore. And even you don't see yourself not seeing it or seeing it. And even then you will have an experience as if you will kind of be consciously unconscious. That will be a very deep experience. You'll encounter nothingness. But then your realization of emptiness is you know that the nothingness is nothing. It's the emptiness of nothing. The emptiness of nothingness. So you realize that nothingness is not an object. It's not a place you are. And that is your realization of emptiness when you drill through the nothingness and your sense of disappearing disappears and you're here. And then where you are is a different place because you're in an infinite relativity. So everything is possible. Do you follow? It's, it's not difficult, is it? It's not rocket science. It's OK. Actually, I learned something marvelous from a friend yesterday that I had never heard. So it's to show you. In 50 years, you can always hear something new. And there's a thing about the realization of, <laughs> of, of emptiness or clear light in the oral tradition, in the Tibetan tradition. And it says, uh, one, nothing appears to me. Right, well, and you, that has a double possible meaning, right? So nothing appears. So I see nothing. I know emptiness. I experience bliss. I am clear light. It's like four points. I really like it. I see nothing. I know emptiness. Because you can't see emptiness, because your seeing is emptiness, of course. I experience bliss. I am clear light. Clear light means clear light of emptiness. It's like clear light is the, how the mind expands in the sense of an infinite emptiness. I just love that. Don't you love that? But what's great about it is that you don't, it doesn't claim that you see emptiness. 
people who think they see emptiness, actually what they did is saw nothing. They thought that was emptiness. Then they get all crazy, you know, they act like I'm, 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 I'm omnipotent, I'm enlightened or something. They get caught in the demon ghost cave, as they say in Zen, of thinking that they're enlightened. But I always like to tease such people. I say, everybody's enlightened then, because everybody sees nothing every night when they fall asleep. And if they have trouble falling asleep, they take an Ambien in order to see nothing. In other words, become unconscious. So, so when you see nothing, then the knowing of emptiness, what does that mean? Negation is a strange thing. A negative cognition, think about it. A negation means, like, there's no elephant in this room. That's a negation. So then if you want to verify, check that out, you look everywhere where there could be an elephant. And then you don't find one, and then you say, yeah, there's no elephant in this room. But you never find a non-elephant, right? You just keep trying, and then you finally decide that, you know, it's, I've, I've looked enough. There's no closure, in other words. It just keeps opening. The, non, the, the lack of an elephant, it keeps opening up. So similarly, knowing the emptiness after seeing nothing means that the nothing is not an object. It's not a place. I'm not in nothing. There is no nothing. Emptiness negates the nothing, in other words. So the nothing doesn't, doesn't get in the way of all the somethings. Do you follow me? In a way, the, the illusory experience of seeing nothing is an, just the last illusion, in a way. And it's a dangerous one, actually. People can become... They say that <clears throat> a nihilist... You know, our modern scientific people are nihilists because they think they have, no, they have a thing that in order... The Western Enlightenment, in order to get away from the church, they decided they didn't have a soul and they couldn't have a future life. And when they, they're just a biological robot and when they die, they're not going to exist. So they're going to become nothing. Right? But, that, but that's only by theory. So they can still be reasoned with, and if they meet somebody who remembers a previous life, or if they have themselves a dream or a memory of something that convinces them that maybe they had a previous deja vu, or a strong one or something, then they're still recoverable from the trap of thinking that really they're nothing, which is the trap of modern culture. Uh, but someone who's had an experience, like a contemplative experience of the realm of nothingness, which is a meditative state, and thinks that's a real thing. There's nothing you can say to them. They just they look, look right through you. That's a, that's a real nihilist, what they call a nihilist by experience. And they're really trapped in the demon ghost cave. They say, you know, in Buddhist psychology. Their psychology is so sophisticated. From even in Hinayana, Theravada, you know, earliest form of Buddhism. Basic form of Buddhism. Okay. So gate, gate, paragate. Gate means gone. So that might be equatable to seeing nothing. Again, second gate, but I know emptiness, so I know whatever I see, if I really try to find it, it will disappear. So emptiness is the constant expansion, the opening of negation, of a sense of objectivity of whatever it is, including your immersion, your, your immersion in a state of nothingness, seeming state of nothingness, right? So knowing emptiness keeps you, they say emptiness is a medicine for becoming attached to the intrinsic objectivity of whatever you see or, or personally experience. Then, by constantly opening, what happens? Your sense of boundary and your sense of self-enclosure melts, and we call that bliss, don't we? Like when you have a thrill, if you're a thrill seeker, you get on the Coney Island cyclone and you get so scared, you have terror when it goes like, <laughs> like that. But then you, if, you, if you get past the fear, you have like a thrill where you sort of dissolve your normal sense of self. You never want to go out and like, <laughs> like this in some kind of terrible thing. It would be so fearful. You would absolutely recoil from it. Like I hate them. I get dizzy. You know? But when I was little, I enjoyed them. Uh, or other kinds of aesthetic experiences where you seemingly melt, you lose your sense of boundary, you merge with the raga, you merge with the symphony, you merge with the aria, you merge with some beautiful thing, you know. 
So that's the experience of bliss, which is, an ex which is it, when it's experience, it's not seized, it's just it's given up. It's where you let go of yourself, you know. And then the thing of I am the clear light is just an affirmation in a way. It's not that you see clear light, it's that you sort of infer clear light, actually. That's a, that's a little more complicated, that's sort of tantric. But that's the bodhi, that's the last one. Gate, gate, paragate, parasamgate. You know, super gone, super totally gone. Those are two further stages of those four. And then the fifth one, Bodhi, enlightenment, all hail. That's like, I am clear light, you know. I am transparency. That's it, that's Buddhahood, you know, right? And every single one of you is going to have that experience. You're going to be a Buddha. Because <laughs> you might as well. <laughs> Because there's no other way out of pain, out of the pain, actually, according to them. Because we are all infinite continua. So we want to be the most best continuum in each of us. And the best continuum is to be a continuum of love and freedom and bliss. Wouldn't you say? It would be nicer to be blissful forever rather than be miserable forever. <laughs> And if you know you're going to be miserable forever, you're definitely going to do something about it. The reason that we're complacent in our materialist culture is that we think we just get annihilated by dying. Very sad. Recently, someone that we know uh, committed, jumped off a bridge. You know, young woman, wonderful young woman, but the tendency to depression, feeling very bereft and unhappy, jumped off a bridge. I think subliminally, that kind of reckless thing has to do with the idea that that will just annihilate the problems. But the problem there is, if you have a problem and you have a body, you have something, you have a space in which to work on the problem. If you have a problem and you eliminate the body, then all you are is the problem. So that's really not a really very good method of dealing with the problem, unfortunately. Okay. Vimalakirti Sutra. Now that we're in a state of, of uh, maybe being at least inferentially open to the unexpected, we're going to look at Doctor Who. How many of you have ever seen Doctor Who programs? Who, or who has never seen Doctor Who? Oh. So that's a little homework for these. <laughs> Try to find on Netflix or BBC or someplace. Doctor Who, if you can find some old Doctor Whos, if they have a BBC, uh, yeah. YouTube or something. I don't know if Doctor Who is available on Netflix. I really don't know. But you know, Doctor Who is very famous in England. Every English person has seen Doctor Who. And it's been, it's been here. And why I say Doctor Who, you know, he's the Time Lord. It's, a, it's the oldest sci-fi, older than Star Trek, English. And um, he's the Time Lord. He has two hearts. And it's very difficult to kill him, therefore. And uh, he deals with all kinds of bad guys by traveling in time. And he travels in time in a, what looks like, from the outside, a London police box. It's like a telephone booth, basically, a blue telephone booth that has a blue light that whirls on top, going It makes a weird noise when it travels through time. But then when you go inside, it's a huge space, many rooms, like a mansion, a palace. And it's a limitless numbers of rooms inside. It's called this TARDIS. Nobody knows how. So Vimalakirti lives in a house where thousands of people go inside. And then he can, he can encompass any number of people, and yet it's like an ordinary-sized house in a town. And this is thousands of years old. And they, don't call it, they didn't call it sci-fi in those days. <laughs> it's a spiritual scripture. And so this is because of infinite relativity. Anything is possible. In other words. So the first chapter is called The Purification of the Buddha Field, as I translated it in those days. And actually still, there's a version online. You don't have to buy this book. There's a slightly updated version on the website of a group called 84,000 online in their reading room. For, it's a free, you know, common copyright or whatever. You know, it's free. My translation is there. And... Um, the Word of the Buddha, the 84,000 website, you can find that online. 
And um, so you can read it. And the first chapter is called Purification of the Buddha Field, because that's a conventional word. But I call it nowadays, I call it a Buddha verse. You know, a Buddha verse is what, how the world seems to be for a Buddha. Like for us, it's a universe. Because each of us in our unenlightenment, and, I'm, and please forgive me if you happen to be enlightened. <laughs> I know you don't mind. But if we're unenlightened, we're in a universe because it all turns, verso means to turn, so it turns around us because each of us secretly is the one of the uni. So it's our universe, right? So a Buddha verse is different. Buddha verse means it all turns toward enlightenment. And the difference of our cognition, self-enclosed, self-centered cognition, I'm not, that doesn't mean we're necessarily too selfish or thing, but we, our wiring is such that we're self-centered. We think we are inside our skin and we are the, in the center of our consciousness or somewhere or maybe in our brain, we think, or something. And, um, but a Buddha doesn't think that. An enlightened being feels they are equally everybody else as themselves, if you can imagine that. You, and you can imagine it if you've ever had a child or been in love. You can, you are identified very strongly with someone else, where you sort of feel you are them, at least for a moment, you know, for a while. You know. Moms do that for a while. And the lovers do that also for a while, all too short, <laughs> usually, right? But a Buddha is a being that feels that way about everybody, and then once they really feel that they're forever, kind of, you know, they are everywhere. They're with everyone. They feel they are everyone. They, therefore, they feel that others' suffering is intolerable. So they manifest whatever they can, and they seem to have very powerful ability to do that manifestation. And they are presented as that anyway, you know. I hope so. I'm still hoping so. I think so. Okay, so all Buddha sutras begin with, I, in those days I wrote, thus have I heard at one time. Although I don't like that nowadays, but that's still, I think I didn't change that because they didn't let me, the editors of the 84,000. Eventually I will change it. Thus did I hear on a special occasion, is what I would like to say, on a certain occasion. Thus did I hear, or rather than have I heard, you know, have I heard? It's like how you hear a rumor, you know, I heard around town, have I heard? But what this phrase means, which is the beginning of all valid Buddhist sutras, which purport to be recordings of Buddha's own activities and statements and deeds and so on. And what that means is that the person who recited this and who others then learned it from or wrote it down, etc., the rapporteur, you could say, did hear this directly from the Buddha on a special occasion. That's what it means. So it's a sort of, it's a statement of authenticity, you know. So have I heard has a little bit rumorish sort of thing about, you know, I heard around, you know. And then they, and then they put the at one time back, at one time the Buddha was somewhere, but that's wrong. It's thus, did I hear on a certain occasion, on a single occasion I heard it. That's what somebody is saying, you know. Anyway, the old Buddha sutras are like that. The Lord Buddha was in residence in the garden of Amrapali, in the city of Vaishali, attended by a great gathering. And this has a kind of funny context, um, because Amrapali was the equivalent of a movie star. She was like Elizabeth Taylor of, uh, age, of that age in Vaishali. You know, she was a great, uh, a great performer and a very, very wealthy and very influential citizen. And the Buddha had a habit when he would visit a city or a town uh, on there because he was a mendicant and his people in the order were mendicants. We, we say monks, but he wasn't really a monk in what we think of as a monk in a monastery. He was a, someone who lived by begging alms and wandered, didn't have a fixed residence. So he would beg and in exchange for the free lunch, he would give a teaching or something. That was like the way he lived once he was enlightened on purpose to sort of spread the, spread the vibe, you know. And um, when he would approach a city, the first person who would invite him and the monks to spend the night in their garden or somewhere, usually he didn't like to go and live in houses, but some, sometimes he did if a king had prepared something. But usually he, he would stay in a garden or in a, in a kind of like a grove or something, you know, where they might have a little hut if it was rainy or something, but otherwise in outdoors like that. And Amrapali 
had a better chariot than the mare, and her horses were faster. So she, when she heard the Buddha was in the neighborhood, she raced with the mayor and she beat the mayor. And uh, she was the first one to say, will you please stay in my garden? And then the mayor came too late, pulled up in a cloud of dust and was all miffed because Buddha was staying, you know, Buddha, great holy man, great wandering philosopher, great sage, was staying in the garden of the movie star rather than in his, you know, mayoral mansion garden or whatever it was. So the mayor and the elders of the city were not going to listen to Buddha. They were all miffed. And he was there in the thing. And then the young people, though, came to see him in the garden, as you'll see in the text. So then they described the assembly of a lot of monks. There are 8,000 monks in his entourage, according to this, and 32,000 bodhisattvas. The bodhisattvas are, come from, some of them come from other universes in Mahayana sutras. Because when a Buddha teaches on a particular planet, then they come zooming in. And they, they, don't, they had aliens. They were happy with aliens. They were nice aliens. Because they were bodhisattvas. And they didn't have to have ships and metal ships, you know, and drive around. They just could go by mind travel, just a zip like that. They could beam into the, this, planet, this solar system or whatever it was. And so some of them are parked in the sky, you know. Then there are all kinds of gods and fairies and elves. quite a collection of entities. And they're described here in detail, which are, you know, about the, about the monks, he said, they were calm and dignified like royal elephants. These are really enlightened mendicants. They had accomplished their work. They were, they were all saints, all of them. They had done what they had to do, cast off their burdens, attained their goals, and totally destroyed the bonds of existence. So in a way, they had attained a kind of nirvana, these, these mendicants. Buddha's disciple. They all had attained the utmost perfection of every form of mind control. They were great yogis and yoginis. There were some nuns also, some female mendicants. And then the bodhisattvas, they go on more at length about the bodhisattvas, you know, which sattva means something like a hero, and bodhi means, or heroine, or hero, it's not gender neutral, and um, bodhi means enlightenment, so enlightenment hero. And they are highly advanced and developed beings, many of them. Some are real beginners, actually. Anybody who gets an idea that they could become a perfectly enlightened being and that that's the best thing to do with your life is try to become that with your living process and makes a vow that I'm going to become a being who is going to be total bubble of bliss forever and I'm going to be so helpful to all the other beings. I'm going to see to it that they become free of suffering. I'm going to bring them all with me. That person becomes a bodhisattva when they, when they really become dedicated like that. They become that, even though they don't have anything like the ability to do it. But in a way, there are two prerequisites. They have to recognize there is such a higher type of consciousness that is achievable, or embodiment and consciousness, as a Buddha, which is not easy to imagine. It's because it's not, it's not a god. It's not an ordinary human. It's something really remarkable, different kind of a being, almost. But it comes out of the human form most easily. Uh, also a divine form, but human form most easily. And um, that's the first thing. One has to be able to imagine that, to have that as a goal that is possible. And then second is one has to have a sense of the conservation of energy, like the second law of thermodynamics, and including one's mind process as an energy, and realize that one will never not be continuing so that it doesn't seem preposterous to say, I'm going to change the entire universe and bring all beings into happiness. Because you might as well, since you're stuck, stuck with them for eternity anyway. <laughs> and when you feel that's the common sense thing, then it becomes like normal. It doesn't become like a crazy thing. You know? If you are a materialist and you think you're only living this one life, like in some Zen centers that I know, and they say, beings are numberless, I vow to save them all from suffering. But that's not a real vow because they don't think that's possible. Because they think they're going to just be dead when they're dead. Because they think they're modern people, you know, and that you don't have to, that you don't have to go into some old-fashioned superstitious idea about being reborn, having a soul. We know better now. We're modern people. You know, they wrongly think because the material scientists pretend they've discovered the lack of the future existence of somebody of themselves. 
They pretend that's a scientific discovery. But can I ask you this question? How come nobody got a Nobel Prize for discovery? Nothing. <laughs> I'm going to write the Nobel Committee in Stockholm and say, I discovered nothing. Can I have a prize? <laughs> what would that mean? Nobody ever discovered nothing. Nobody knows that there's no person after death outside of the body. Nobody knows that. They act like it's just heresy to talk about. But they don't know that. That's a blind faith. Actually, there's no evidence that anything is nothing. In fact, the contrary, that, that nothing is nothing is what you'd expect. So nobody's going to become nothing. So I have a slogan I like to do when I talk about the Book of the Dead. A lot of you have heard it, I'm sure, too many times. Nobody gets out of here a dead. <laughs> so that's the second prerequisite. So that there is this possibility of this, this higher form of existence, of being an enlightened being, and that you have endless time to achieve it, where you and all beings will be in a state of permanent bliss without any suffering. That that's possible. And if therefore highly desirable. There couldn't be anything more desirable, don't you think? You know, but do we, do we believe that such a thing? No. We can't imagine it. And so therefore we have to work to imagine it. That takes effort. But it becomes imaginable in the context of infinite relativity and infinite and eternal also. So infinite in time as well as space. Given infinite time, anything could happen. And given infinite rel relational reality, anything can happen, right? I mean, this whole, you know, they have this thing, you know, planets are running away from us. Well, no wonder they're running away from us. <laughs> With politicians, politicians and leaders, world leaders like we have today, I'd be running away too if I was a different galaxy, you know. So naturally they're running away, you know. And um, then, therefore, the, you know, the, they say that the universe is such that if there is anything beyond a certain distance, then the, light, then the light would have no time to get back here. You know what I mean? They have a, a theory like that because of their notion of speed of light. But that doesn't mean there isn't something that we don't see that's beyond that. The, and the idea that, the, you know, you know, that there's even an argument about finite versus infinite is ridiculous. Because if you say finite, it means it has a limit. Something that has a limit... In order for it to be a limit, there has to be something on the other side. <laughs> right? You have a boundary, then there's something on the other side. You can't have a boundary and nothing on the other side. Because then you say nothing is there. And that, that's a senseless statement. Right? Yeah? Some of you look skeptical. Yeah. Well, because people are scared of infinity, of course. Because then they, they, everything could be out of control, you know. They don't know something might pop up out of infinity. You know, if our whole universe that we see, you know, could be itself inside a subatomic particle inside a different dimensional universe, then some bulldozer could run over it <laughs> one second from now. It would be much worse than Santa Barbara or an earthquake or like a hurricane, you know. The whole thing could instantly be destroyed, right? Like, or, you know, or we could be a subatomic particle in somebody in another giant universe's electron accelerator and they're looking for the Higgs boson. <laughs> they, they just blow us up. Us and all the bozos in the White House and here and there. You know? <laughs> so, about the bodhisattvas, they really, they were expert in knowing the spiritual faculties of all living beings. They were brave with the confidence that overawes all assemblies. They had gathered the great stores of merit and of wisdom, and their bodies were beautiful without ornaments, or beautiful without ornaments, were adorned with all the auspicious signs and marks. They were exalted in fame and glory like the lofty summit of Mount Sumeru. That's the planetary axis, actually, in the old world model. Their high resolve, or that's their messianic resolve to be Buddhas, you know, to save all beings from suffering, as hard as diamond, unbreakable in their faith in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Dharma means the reality and the teaching of reality. Sangha means the community. Buddha is the teacher. They showered forth the rain of ambrosia that is released by the light rays of the jewel of the Dharma, which shines everywhere. And then he goes on, and then they are inexhaustible minds of limitless virtues, and they glorified innumerable Buddha fields with the splendor of these virtues. 
were one to extol them for innumerable hundreds of thousands of myriads of aeons, one still could not exhaust their mighty flood of virtues. The Bodhisattvas, they're these amazing, wonderful things. Yes? What? So, are there Bodhisattvas among us? Or I'm sorry? Are there Bodhisattvas among us? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, undoubtedly. Well, the, I mean, you know, modern materialists would think that such beings were f mythical, of course. But, uh, but uh, Buddhists don't think so. Again, because, you see, you know, maybe they're simple-minded Buddhists, but on the other hand, in the context of infinite relativity, if an infinite internal relativity, anything is possible. So, since one can't disprove that there are all these kind of extraordinary beings, then, okay, these people say they are there, we are kind of doubtful. We don't think we've seen anybody like that lately that we've noticed, unless we have seen some extraordinary person, which maybe some of us have. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a stretch. That's why I say the goal is to imagine. And that's why we begin with Heart Sutra, where if you, what the meaning of emptiness is, is negation, where you, we shatter our, our normal convictions about that's a solid pillar and this just this way and I'm just that way and that's just what it is. Because, you know, actually we just don't really know that. You know? I mean, even, you know, if you don't go even to that extent, you know, you know the old story I always tell about the, the, the quantum physicist who had snowshoes in his lab. Have you heard me tell that one? Oh my, you heard me do that one. He has snowshoes on the wall of his lab, puts them on. Because when he goes in the lab, he thinks of himself as a bunch of empty space with a bunch of atoms and electrons and nuclei in it. And he doesn't want to fall through into the subway or into the core of the Earth, you know, by gravity, because he's just a bunch of electrons and mostly empty space. So we know that's a model of what we are. We're made of atoms and things, right? We think, we think. And yet we also think, this is me, solid flesh and blood and bone. But actually... We know that the scientists would say we're not. We look at us in an X-ray machine. We just know, you know, a CAT scan. We, it doesn't even seem strange to us. But we don't expect that we can perceive that ourselves. But actually, we are. Therefore, what we are seeing, thinking, is the objective reality of a flesh and blood. What what uh, John Perry Barlow calls a meat space human. <laughs> we're here in meat space, but we think that's just it. That's objectively real. So we have a big conviction: this is me. But actually, we even know from science that that's illusory. I, I'm, it's not, it doesn't not exist, we're here, but we're not what we think we are. So we know that. And these people take it just a lot further. <laughs> they did, you know, from old, old time. So then, anyway, now what happens is this very strange thing. I remember when I was translating this, I couldn't even believe myself on like the third page. You know, there's the Buddha, he's sitting there, and then, the gods are all there. And the guy Brahma, the god Brahma Shikin, he's like what the people of Buddha's era thought was the creator god. You know, Yehovah, Yahweh, that's Yahweh, from Indian Yahweh at that time, monotheistic creator god. But here he shows up, and the creator gods of other, of other universes can't come too, whole crowds of them. Because they always like to go when Buddha's going to, or something amazing is going to happen, they always go. What do you know? You know, they say Zeus is there. Chakra means a kind of Zeus type of figure, and all of other ones. Anyway, there he's sitting. Okay, then these young kids from the city come out because their parents are not coming, and they come out. They want to see the Buddha. They don't care. He's in that garden of a movie star. They're not freaking out about it. And they're bringing these Indian kind of jeweled parasols. You know, they're very wealthy. The reason Buddhism happened in India 2,500 years ago is it was the richest part of Eurasia by far, more than Egypt, more than Mesopotamia, more than China. India was the absolute richest. And, you know, you know Maharaja's weight in jewels type of thing, you know, rich. So they bring out these jeweled parasols. Then they put the jeweled parasols on it. So, so they come. The Lichavi, Lichavi is the name of the nation in which the city of Vaishali was. Bodhisattva Ratnakara. Ratnakara means jewel mine, his name. With 500 Lichavi youths, each holding a precious parasol made of seven different kinds of jewels, came forth from the city of Vaishali and presented himself at the grove of Amarpali. Each approached the Buddha, bowed at his feet, 
circumambulated him clockwise seven times, laid down his precious parasol in offering, and withdrew to one side. That's just a formality that they do when they meet some kind of holy man in India. But then this one, as soon as these precious parasols had been laid down, suddenly by the miraculous power of the Buddha, they were transformed into a single precious canopy, so great that it formed a covering for this entire billion world galaxy. The surface, you know, even the word galaxy and billion worlds is there, but galaxy is just kind of a, you know, to fit it in our cosmology is just somehow hopeful. <laughs> but it's a, it's a different cosmology, but still billion different worlds, really. And he made a parasol out of the pile of jeweled parasols. And I was trying to figure out, what is that, a canopy? And I realized it's like a planetarium. He created a temporary planetarium as a special effect, the Buddha did, out of those parasols to teach people something. And he said, it formed a covering. The surface of the entire billion world galaxy was reflected in the interior of the great precious canopy where the total content of this galaxy could be seen. Limitless mansions of suns, moons, and stellar bodies. The realms of the gods, dragons, goblins, fairies, etc., titans, all these other mythological animals from our modern point of view. And the realm of different gods and things, mountains, all the great oceans, rivers, bays, torrents, streams, brooks, and springs, all the villages, suburbs, cities, capitals, provinces, and wildernesses. All this could be clearly seen by everyone. And the voices of all the Buddhas of the Ten Directions could be heard proclaiming their teachings of the Dharma in all the worlds, the sounds reverberating in the space beneath the great precious canopy. So he just created a vision of everyone of total interconnection, of total sort of presence in the, in the like, of nature, like, but in a completely inconceivable way, actually. It's, again, unimaginable. Imagination-stretching vision, like you might have in a, in a planetarium, you know? You know, there are stars and different galaxies, and then they can go different things. Then you're out in the Hubble telescope pictures they can show you, or they can show you different environments on Earth, you know? If you go up to the Rose Planetarium, you know, used to be the Hayden Planetarium, now it's the Rose Planetarium, right? So he showed that to people. First thing, yes, yes. I'm sorry, what? The millions and billions. I mean, is, is galaxy for yes. your word, or is it a? Well, the millions and billions number is there, and I'm trying to fit in galaxies. It's called world system by them. So I'm putting a modern notion of a world system, you know. But you could say universes, even, actually, you could say. But I just chose galaxies to give people a little bit sense of, of proportion, you know. But it's an unimaginable thing. I mean, imagine, suddenly you have a vision of, your, of the interconnection of everything in the world. If we had that today, I think that climate deniers might go and eliminate some morons in the Congress who are running around pretending that the military is not allowed to build the docks at Newport News uh, at a six foot higher because they're expecting the sea level to rise because the military studies the environment. But now they're not allowed to mention that. They can't do a single thing about preparing for climate. Otherwise, military was, a, was saying that it's a major threat to the nation, which is their job is to defend the nation, not against people, but against an outraged environment, right? But now they're not allowed to by certain employees, you know the joke, you know it's a really bad recession because ExxonMobil has laid off 200 congressmen. <laughs> <laughs> yes? What's that? When you say planetary system, are they referring to the planetary system? Yeah. Are you referring to the planetary chain system? Chain? Well, I'm just roughly saying planetary system, solar system. We're in a solar system. They have a different cosmology in these days. Yeah, Buddha is not conflict. From the Vedas. But what? From the Vedas, the planetary system. Yeah, just the universe, you know. Uh, many universes. You know. <clears throat> anyway, at the vision of the magnificent miracle, affected by the supernatural power of the Lord Buddha, although nowadays I would not say it's supernatural, I would say supernormal. 
I don't like the supernatural because some of these extraordinary things that they claim happen in the world are just super normal. They're not our normal, but that doesn't mean they're not natural, actually. They say when you die, for example, you, when your mind is free of the wetware of the brain, even when we don't have Alzheimer's and we can't remember anybody's name, um, we become nine times more intelligent. So when we attend our own funeral as a temporary sort of ghost-like creature, we can immediately read everybody's mind. And when we meet that uncle who is saying, oh, Bob, I'm so sad, he died, isn't it terrible? And then we read his mind, he's saying, good riddance, I'm tired of him lecturing me about my, my, my uh, stupid political views. Um, uh, don't be upset, because everybody has different levels in their mind, you know, and then everybody's ambivalent, and they have different voices inside themselves. And, and when you become clairvoyant, you know what's in their mind, and it's, it's very, it can be upsetting. you are not used to it. So, anyway, the entire host was ecstatic, enraptured, astonished, delighted, satisfied, and filled with awe and pleasure. He all bowed to the to Tagata, that is the enlightened Buddha, withdrew to one side and, and gazed upon him. Then they give some very nice praises they go on with, which I'm not going to read, but they're really good, actually. These young, young kids were really smart, and they gave really good praises of the Buddha. They praised him in a really meaningful way, actually. A whole bunch of verses that are very eloquent and wonderful. But then, um, then, then the head guy, the head young man, the head yuppie, these are all yuppies, the head yuppie, Ratnakara, he, having celebrated the Buddha with these verses, further addressed him, oh Lord, these 500 young lichavis are truly on their way to unexcelled perfect enlightenment. That is, they already have taken bodhisattva vows, they've imagined being fully enlightened, they want to become a being of bliss that can be a benefit to all beings. They want to do it, but they're really puzzled about one thing. They can change themselves, in other words, but how do you change the universe? So they have all asked, what is the Bodhisattva's purification of the Buddhaverse, or the Buddha field? How do you purify or perfect, you know? How do you make the world perfect? They can see changing themselves, but how can you change the whole world? It seems impossible, in other words, they're saying. Please, Lord, explain to them the Bodhisattva's purification, or you could translate perfection, of the Buddha field, or the Buddha of the world, that is, the universe. Upon this request, the Buddha gave his approval to the young Lichavi Radnakara. He said, good, good young man. Your question to the Buddha about the purification of the Buddha field is very good. So listen, and I'll explain it to you. So very good, Lord, replied Radnakara, and the 500 young Lichavis set themselves to listen. So then the Buddha says, this is very important. He says, noble sons, children, I, should, I think in my new verse I say noble children, because there are some females there. A Buddha field of bodhisattvas is a field of living beings. Why so? A bodhisattva embraces a Buddha field to the same extent that he causes the development of living beings. He embraces a Buddha field to the same extent that living beings become educated. He embraces the Buddha field to the same extent that through entrance into a Buddha field, living beings are introduced to the Buddha no uh, wisdom. Gnosis, I wrote in these days. I don't like that anymore. Buddha intuition, I would call it. He embraces the Buddha field to the same extent that through entrance into that Buddha verse, living beings increase their holy spiritual faculties, which are like you know, faith, wisdom, discernment, analysis. There's a set of five. Why so, noble son? A Buddha field of bodhisattvas springs from the aim of living beings. Now, this is a very important point. In other words, the universe is an intersubjective mind field of beings. This is a Buddhist scientific claim that the world is not just a bunch of rocks in which some sentient beings are running around trying not to get hit by any rocks. The whole universe is the intersection of the minds of infinite variety of living beings, which includes divine beings, many kinds of them, not necessarily monotheistic type of creators, but all kinds of very powerful minded beings of other dimensions and things, and human beings, and animals, and insects, and then very, very wretched forms of life as well, terrible, horrible stuff. And, and it's the intersection of our minds that create the world, actually. It isn't like one person's mind can create or shift the world that easily, but overall we do shift the world, you know? And uh, so we, we, we are 
responsible. Each of us is a kind of creator of our world in a certain way. Not only culturally speaking, you know, like we so that we can kind of accept, we think, but we think the matter is really solid. But actually, we even shape the matter. Is a kind of radical Buddhist claim, and it's presented as a scientific claim, actually. And therefore, within that, these seemingly supernormal things are somehow a reality, supposedly. And I, I'm just as dubious as you are because I, you know, about that because you know, it's, I haven't seen these things. I have sort of seen some things that are not explicable normally. I've seen supernormal things, experienced supernormal things, but I haven't seen people making a giant thing out of a bunch of umbrellas. <laughs> and then the next thing is even more. So then, then he says another very important thing. He says, for example, Ratnakara, should one wish to build in empty space, one might go ahead in spite of the fact that it is not possible to build or to adorn anything in empty space. In just the same way, should a bodhisattva who knows full well that all things are like empty space, wish to build a Buddhaverse in order to develop living beings, he might go ahead in spite of the fact that it is not possible to build or to adorn a Buddha field in empty space. So in a way, he says, to transform the world into a Buddhaverse is impossible. And yet that's what we do. We do the impossible. He says what he's saying. The art of the impossible is what Buddhas do, which is a very challenging kind of statement, actually. It really is, especially nowadays, in this era, what some people would dignify by calling a something era. It seems impossible that we could transform this into a Buddhaverse, the mess that they're making. But that's what he's insisting. And it is impossible, he admits, but we do it anyway, sort of thing. And this is sort of connected to the idea of the plasticity of the universe. And that it is the intersection of infinite numbers of beings' minds. And the mind is very powerful. And let me give you a more simple example. Take a nuclear weapon dropped on Hiroshima, let's say. Immensely destructive thing, mushroom cloud, right, the whole thing, right? Oppenheimer looked up in the one in Nevada and he said, now we have become the destroyer, you know, of the universe. He had some knowledge of Indian religion. He, you know, Shiva, the destroyer, you know, he related it to. And uh, then there's all kind of formulas, you know, nuclear power, plutonium, decay rate, decay rate of, of highly unstable isotopes of things. And then there's some kind of energy put into it, heat and energy of something exploding that's a trigger mechanism. And then it's a structure and it goes like that, back and back and back. But what is one ingredient? that we normally wouldn't think of. No, your material, your physicist would not think. That is hatred in a person's mind. The hatred in the person's mind, first of all, would create and invent and design it, thinking that there might be a case I want to destroy a lot of people and a lot of real estate. And then definitely there's hatred that is the triggering mechanism. Somebody presses a button who wants to destroy a bunch of people. You know, we want to destroy the Japanese because they were, we were fighting them on Iwo Jima and things, and it's too tiresome to fight them man to man. So we're going to destroy a bunch of civilians, and that'll scare them into surrendering. And also it'll scare the Russians off from invading the Northern Ireland, as we now know is one of the main motives, actually, rather than scaring the Japanese high command, it was also scaring the Russians. But anyway, never mind. Point is that hatred is an energy, and it moves your finger to press a button, and then this can kill innumerable amounts of people when you magnify that hatred technologically. So a nuclear explosion is a hatred-developed device. It comes from hatred. And of course, intelligence shapes the activity of the hatred, but it's definitely hatred. So that's a mental energy that's part of nature. It's not super normal, and it's, it's a trigger mechanism. Without that, you will not have a nuclear bomb, right? So the mind is part of it. Yeah, what are you going to say? Fear. What? Fear. Isn't it fear that, that triggers oh. equation? Okay, okay. Just quibble, quibble. You're a physicist, so you don't believe that the mind is a force in nature. No. That's what they don't believe. No, I, I, I don't. But, but I don't want to discuss it. But it <laughs> fine. Fear, hatred, same, similar. But it's hatred, actually, is the reaction. Hatred triggers the thing. Fear, you would go cower somewhere. You wouldn't necessarily bomb bunch of people running around in paper houses wearing kimonos trying to make like some sushi. 
Not really. You would drop it, and it's like they have no excuse. Truman had no excuse of not dropping it in the bay. He would leave why Hiroshima. He could put it in Tokyo Bay, and it'd be a lot of dead fish, which would be unfortunate. But if he was trying to scare some people, that'd be a good way to scare them. At least give them one shot and blow it up in the bay. No, he drops it on a city. And in second city, too. Not good. Bad karma. <clears throat> but anyway, my point is only that there is the power of mind. So if you expand from that, the interaction of millions of minds, you know, billions, countless, innumerable minds, and not all just human minds, also some sort of superhuman type of being, that this creates the world, shapes the, the inert matter, you know. Right? Because matter, what is matter? You guys, you blow it up in your electron accelerator, and then you see some fragments of things, and ah, oh, Higgs boson. Otherwise, we don't even know what is mass. And even they say Higgs boson, we don't know what that is really. And it's surrounded by all this dark matter, and we never even saw that. So it's like, a, it's the whole thing is like a construct of inferences. And nobody really knows what matter even is. So it's not as preposterous, in other words, to say that if the universe is a collective mind field of beings, an intersecting and interactive mind field of beings. We certainly know that the quality of our experience in a group at a dinner, at a party, is what the, are the vibes of people in their mind and how friendly and loving and careful and kind and self-restrained they are versus how angry with each other and what bad moods they're in and how they want to have a fight or whatever. You know, we know that just changes the whole space. We do know that. It can be lethal even. We know that. So mind is really a power, you know. That's a very important point in Buddhist science, not just a fantasy, you know. So anyway, Buddha goes on in the long soliloquy about how the Buddha verse is made of all positive things, made of generosity, made of morality, made of patience and tolerance, made of love, made of compassion. Made, he just goes on with every positive thing, you made of wisdom, every possible positive thing you can think of. And he ends by saying, the purity of the Buddha verse or Buddha field reflects the purity of living beings. The purity of living beings reflects the purity of his wisdom. Purity of his wisdom reflects the purity of his teaching. Purity of his teaching, the Bodhisattva that is, reflects the purity of the transcendental practice. And the purity of his transcendental practice reflects the purity of his own mind, that is to say Bodhisattva, the one who makes the Buddha field, you know, becomes a Buddha and makes the Buddha field. So then one of the Buddha's disciples, who's a saint actually, and is already enlightened in a certain way, as far as their personal sense of nirvana. They've already achieved that. But their souls are running around and they don't see the world as having changed. And they don't understand nirvana as being something either everybody has or nobody has. They think somehow they still have a personal nirvana. And this comes up later, that you can be liberated from suffering without taking everybody with you, which ultimately Buddha doesn't agree. But he lets them think that because those particular persons who are male mostly, Brahmins mostly, and who don't want to go in the kitchen and whatever, you know, they couldn't they conceive of changing the whole world, you know, so they can just change themselves. So he lets them do that. So he thinks, if the Buddha field is perfect only to the extent that the mind of the Bodhisattva is perfect, then when Shakyamuni Buddha, that's the one standing in front of him, that's the Buddha, our historical Buddha, was engaged in the career of the Bodhisattva, his mind must have been imperfect. Otherwise, how could this Buddhaverse, this world, appear to be so imperfect? He's a Buddha, so this should be his Buddha world, according to this theory, but it's very imperfect. So he must have been a really crappy Bodhisattva. <laughs> he just thinks this because he doesn't want to be irreverent to his beloved Buddha. So then Buddha, knowing telepathically the thought of the venerable Shariputra, said to him, what do you think, Shariputra? Is it because the sun and moon are impure that those blind from birth do not see them? The sun and moon are imperfect? They don't have light or something because they're not visible to a blind person? He says, no, Lord, it is not so. The fault lies with the, those blind from birth and not with the sun and moon. Otherwise, they just don't have the ability to see them. But it declared in the same way, Shariputra, the fact that some beings do not behold the splendid display of the virtues and merits of the Buddha field of the Buddha, of the Tathagata, the transcendent Buddha, is due to their own ignorance. It is not the fault of the Buddha. 
Shariputra, the Buddha field of the Tathagata is perfect, pure, but you do not see it. Then the Brahma Sikin, that is the, the creator god, but Buddhists don't believe there is a creator god, but the people in the society at that time think he's the creator. It's kind of interesting to have him weigh in here. And he starts scolding Shariputra. He says, oh, Shariputra, you have a poor vision and I see it as perfect. I see the Buddha world as perfect. So God jumps in and says, that's perfect. You know, Backs Buddha up. So then, but Shariputra holds his ground because he's very wise. And he says, well, as for me, O Brahma, I see this great earth with its highs and its lows, its thorns, its precipices, its peaks and its abysses, as if it were entirely filled with excrement. It's like a pile of crap, I see it, basically, he says. And the Brahma Shikin replied, the fact that you see such a Buddha field as this, as if it were so imperfect and impure, Reverend Shariputra, is a sure sign that there are highs and lows in your mind and that your positive thought in regard to the Buddha wisdom is not perfect either. Reverend Shariputra, those whose minds are impartial toward all living beings and whose positive thoughts toward the Buddha intuition are pure, see this Buddha field as perfectly pure. So Brahma ins insists that Shariputra has imperfect vision. That's the problem. But Shariputra doesn't agree because he thinks his vision is the real vision. So then Buddha takes his foot like this and he goes like that. He touches the ground with his big toe. And then he produces a second special effect, like the first one where he showed that canopy, like the planetarium. Now he shows a much more powerful one where suddenly everybody sees the world as perfect. They see it as the best of all possible worlds for themselves. They did see themselves in the best possible place for learning what they need to learn on their path toward Buddhahood. And they suddenly don't blame the environment. They don't blame the imperfection of their circumstances and their situation. They realize that somehow their own view of it is imperfect. And that they actually, in the best possible place, like they're in the best seat in the house. They suddenly feel that way. And they put it in terms of, they say, thereupon the Lord touched the ground of the billion world galactic universe with his big toe. And suddenly it was transformed into a huge mass of precious jewels. They put it in terms of you know, something of value, you know, so they say jewels. A magnificent array of many hundreds of thousands of clusters of precious gems until it resembled the universe of the Tathagata Ratnavyuha, that's a Buddha who's in a jewel plasma universe. Anantaguna Ratnavyuha. Everyone in the entire assembly was filled with wonder, each perceiving himself or herself seated on a throne of jewel lotuses. And of course, you know, the, the, this is Indian thing about jewels. We think of that as not comfortable, sitting on a bunch of diamonds, <laughs> like how completely uncomfy. But in the Indian um, sort of thing, they, they are called divine gems that are like jewel plasma, like liquid diamond, you know, like pillows made of ruby, liquid ruby. You know, they sort of the substance is, is kind of cozy. You know. So then the Buddha said to Venerable Shariputra, Shariputra, do you see this splendor of the virtues of the Buddha field? And, uh, and he said, I see it, Lord. Here before me is a display of splendor such as I never before heard of or beheld. So in a way, the Buddha just gives a different vision of the thing to Shariputra and makes them, the real idea of it is makes you feel you're in the perfect place for yourself to learn whatever you need to learn. You're in the best of all possible world. And then Buddha says, Shariputra, this Buddha field is always thus pure and perfect, but the transcendent one makes it appear to be spoiled by many faults in order to bring about the maturity of lowly living beings. And then he gives some examples of how different th people see things in different ways. When this splendor of the beauty of the virtues of the Buddha field shone forth, 84,000 beings present conceived the spirit of unexcelled perfect enlightenment. That means they decided they wanted to be a Buddha who could see it like that all the time, who knew it to be a Buddhaverse, not a universe, but a Buddhaverse. And the 500 Lichavi youths who had accompanied the young Lichavi Radnakara all attained the conformative tolerance of ultimate birthlessness. So that's kind of a technical thing of where they suddenly realize that everything is kind of unproduced. It's all unfinished. It could be whatever it could be. Do you know what I mean? It could be all great. In infinite, given infinite relativity, it could be really. In other words, they, they became tolerant of being unable to clamp their conviction of how they saw it to be, how it really was. 
So they became open to illusoriness, in other words, if you follow me. So they became open-minded, actually, is really what it means. But it sounds very technical. The conformative tolerance of ultimate birthlessness. It means it isn't the full tolerance. It's just one that's following an inference, actually. Therefore, it's conforming to what is reasonable. But it isn't visceral yet. But it's still pretty good. Then the Lord withdrew his, mir his miraculous power, and at once the Buddha field was restored to its usual appearance. Then both humans and gods who subscribe to the dis disciple vehicle, that's the individual vehicle I call it nowadays, they thought, alas, all constructed things are impermanent. So that's the beginning of the thing. Now the Vimalakirti <coughs> is introduced in the following chapters, but this is the basic thrust of the whole Mahayana, the universal vehicle teachings of the Buddha. And the Mahayana people think the Buddha taught that. Scholars and people, and also the Sri Lankan people nowadays, who are very orthodox individual vehicle, what I call, you know, who don't think that a Buddha has such ability. They just think each person has to get out of the world for themselves. They don't think a being can be a bodhisattva and become a Buddha. They don't think, they, they think you shouldn't even try, you should just save yourself. And at least when you, once you save yourself, you won't harm others. So it's actually good, but they, they, and they, they wouldn't want to be a Buddha if they thought you could, they just don't think so. And originally, uh, Buddha let some people follow his view like that. Although he was very, very careful, I can discuss this at more length, he was very, very careful to hint that it might not be so, that you couldn't have a personal nirvana isolated from other beings. That that's not possible. Because in a way, nirvana is the absolute, you know. And he, Buddha's whole message is that the absolute is fine. The absolute is bliss. The absolute is freedom from suffering. He, freedom from suffering is a sort of conservative way to say bliss. You know, bliss is for people more suspicious when you say bliss, especially people in cultures where bliss is illegal. <laughs> it's some kind of, it's an illegal drug or something, or it's a wrong kind of wine or whatever. So, so, um, so he was concerned and said, freedom from suffering, nirvana is. But of course, it's bliss. So in the universal vehicle, they think that Buddha taught this. But in the beginning of his, in his lifetime, he taught the Mahayana universal vehicle as almost an esoteric teaching. <coughs> he wanted to establish first in India his monastic order or his mendicant order and to enlist people wholesale. They, everybody's not easily going to sign up to like become a Buddha and save everybody else from suffering. You know, the Messiah complex is not that easy for people. And they all have explanations of how they don't have to really worry about that much, that some god will take care of it, or Buddha will take care of it, or somebody else. And they not, not everybody has to take you know, what they call in the Mahayana universal responsibility for everybody else which is like one of the Dalai Lama, even today, a major concept, how we're all responsible for everything. And far from that being a crushing burden, it is like a doorway to, to exhilaration, actually. It's a doorway to joy, you know, because it's so crazy, the idea, you better be joyful. If you're responsible for everybody, you better cheer up. Because <laughs> everybody knows you are not effective in helping others unless you're happy yourself. Everybody knows that. You know, you can't really help others if you're so miserable. You cannot. And then I, I won't do it, but you all know, I always give the Zoloft commercial as an example <laughs> of why everybody knows that. Do you know the Zoloft commercial? I mean, all of you have heard me say that, but if those of you who have not, it's a commercial for a mood-altering drug that they sell, right? And the scene is a suburban kitchen and the mom in the kitchen is really freaking out. And her plastic waffle that she bought from General Mills is smoking in the toaster. And the baby has thrown its pablum on the floor. And the dog is doing some horrible thing on the floor. And the husband is freaking out because he wants his coffee and wears his paper and whatever. And she's just beside herself. And she can manage this nasty situation that she's being called on to be responsible for everything. And then the pan camera pans outside the window to the field where there were, all these, there were all these yellow like daisy flowers, you know. And then they detach from their stem 
and they form the word and the sky outside the kitchen window. Zola. <laughs> and then this gives you the idea that she took this tranquilizer, this mood-altering happiness pill, and then suddenly, bam, she puts in more waffles. Get your own coffee to the husband. Kid here, dog out the dog door. Out the, you know, she's like, bam, 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 in charge. No problem, takes care of the whole thing. Because the God Zoloft made her feel good, you see. Then you run and everybody runs out and tells their doctor to prescribe Zoloft. So they can get through breakfast, the nightmare of breakfast, with a bunch of annoying people in the family. So that means that everybody subliminally knows that when you're really grooving, you can get, you're much more effective whatever you do, even if you're on the luge or you're doing the Winter Olympics. The guys going up and down the tube there, the ones who are feeling really confident and joyful, that really, or the quadruple axle or whatever the stuff they do. Those are the ones who are, can do it. The ones who are feeling, ah, I don't feel good today, I have a headache. Splat, you know? <laughs> right? We all know that. So, so anyway, this is the challenge. So later on in another chapter, you know, we only have three lessons on this, and I'll come to this in detail, but later on in another chapter, Avimala Kirti, who is introduced in the next uh, chapters, uh, he sends out for lunch, for takeout, to another universe. <laughs> and he sends out to this other universe for the leftover, chapter 10, of a universe that's all made of perfume. It's all Chanel number five or whatever. The whole universe and the people's bodies are made of perfume, the food is made of perfume, the trees, the ground, everything is perfume. The Buddha in that universe never speaks a word of a lecture. He just radiates a certain scent. And the bodhisattvas who are sitting in their incense bodies, they take a sniff and then they're in like million samadhis. You know, they're like great meditative attainment. And yet they're kind of weak. They're bored, of course, because they're in this celestial type environment, Buddhaverse that's made up like a, formed into a kind of celestial place where they needed obviously to take a break. <laughs> and they're taking a break, but they're bored. Samadhi after samadhi, and like perfume after perfume. And they say, this guy from this other universe sends out to our universe across the galaxies, as there are many, as many galaxies, there are grains of sand and 62 Ganges riverbeds, he sends over here for takeout. <laughs> So what kind of place must he must be far out? We want to go. We, we want to visit him because they have, they're really highly developed and they have mind transformation, mind travel powers. So they asked the Buddha, "Can we go back with him and see them while they're having lunch and see what their world is like? We're a little bit bored here." So they go back, and the Buddha went. He says, "You can go, but you can't go smelling like that, because <laughs> those beings, if they take one sniff of you, they're going to go crazy. They're not used to such a level of pleasure." You know? It'll freak them out, you know, they'll get all crazy, you know. So you have to change your body as you, as you travel across space. And they do that. But then when they get here, they weren't expecting it. They're going like, what is this planet, you know? What's wrong with the sewage system? Like, what's wrong? The meat space here is really crude and everything. And they have an argument with Bhimla Kirti, like, how come this Buddha has such a shoddy planet? <laughs> And then, Buddha, then Bhimla Kirti says, no, actually, this is the best planet because samadhi generate more and more wisdom in your perfume world is great, but you are so removed from any suffering of other beings. It has something almost unreal to you, even though you're deeply wise in a certain way, but you don't develop your compassion. And if you want to be a Buddha, you have to develop your love and compassion as well as your wisdom. Just having this kind of deep wisdom by itself without compassion is, is sort of inert, you know? And so, although this is more of a struggle here, the, wor the, wor the world is maintained, is worldscaped at a level where there's more of struggle for beings. This matures them in their interactiveness, in their compassion, you know? And this they really need, you know? And you know what? There's this study that I'm all wigged out about. And I'm already forgetting where I read it because I want to be able to cite it. There was a recent study about longevity. And you know what they found out? They found out that someone who they call a social scientist, you know, they call socially integrated. The degree of social integration of someone, meaning how many friends they have, how good their friendships are, how much the friends like them, how much they like their friends. 
and how wide that network is, that is a more powerful predictor of longevity than whether they quit smoking, whether they quit drinking, whether they're on diets, whether they're at their ideal weight, blah, blah, whether they exercise regularly, <coughs> that, that, that those are all predictors. And of course, you should do all those good things. But the most important predictor is the social network of the person. That's the one who's going to live longer. It's like the, having a pet also increases your, having a, a dog, a puppy, or a kitten or something, that increases your longevity. At least that's a, some people who are hiding in their high security apartment with five locks on the door and worried about the mugger and the terrorist and whatever and uh, watching Fox News and getting really scared, you know. And that person, at least they have a dog to pet and then they're not going to croak right away. But the point is the isolation level is really bad for your health. And so even they're in a perfume universe, but in a way they're just in their own meditation space. And that's not that good for them, actually. And that's why they want to go see where this guy sent here for takeout, you know. So the argument is, this world of ours is best of possible world. This is the best one for our evolutionary development toward our own perfect Buddhahood, which we're all going to achieve. We could go into a perfume universe, but we'd be there forever without really developing the body of Buddhahood. The loving, kind, compassionate body, which you have to develop as well as the as the mind, you know, through meditation. You know, so so that's the argument of the Vimalakirti. Actually, it's very, very amazing and unique, and it's very elaborate. And we'll see about it. now. Now, the reason Vimalakirti is very well known, and not so much in Tibet. Actually, they were not that fond of this sutra in Tibet. Although it's usual in Tibet, they have a Lama who's the reincarnation of Vimalakirti. I have a Lama friend who passed away now a few years ago, but who is a very deep scholar, and he was remarkable. And actually, he proved himself to his disciples because he sat, what they call, sat in clear light. That is to say, his body remained erect and in a meditative posture without any decay for three or four days. More, even more amounts once they can say for weeks, actually. So they call it sitting in clear light. But this guy, at least, he made it three or four days before he crumpled over and started, you know, rotting. In the meat space, things started rotting. But they don't rot to show their connection with sort of the deepest reality, their liberation. You know, they do that for the student. They don't do that because they're, they're worried about their meat space body. They're not. Anyway, before he died, the, the disciples who, who had been studying with him for years, the students, you know, and he also taught in a graduate school in Charlottesville, of all places. And uh, they were in a sort of devotional mood, after some, maybe some great teaching or something. You know. And he said, Geshala, you're so wonderful, and you're such a great teacher, and you really practice what you preach, and we really love you, and all this. And how come you're not a reincarnation? You know, one of these like high lamas was a reincarnation. And he said, you know, he said, I always wanted to be. But, but all the good ones were taken. <laughs> Do you get what I mean by that? It's like, if we, had that, if we had that in America, it would be like, oh, Clinton is the reincarnation of Jefferson. You know? Oh, Bush is the reincarnation of Adams. Oh, you know, and you couldn't even run for office if you proved you were the reincarnation of somebody. And then you have some guy who's really a good guy and a great congressman, and really, but he said, well, already everybody in American history who was ever a good person, they're already reincarnated, so all the good ones are taken. So I can't say I'm the reincarnation of so-and-so and such-and-such. -and -such. I love that. I think that's so funny. I really do. And they overdo their pedigree, you know. His Holiness the Dalai Lama once said, when confronted with the bad behavior of some lamas, after saying about how the disciples who were disillusioned and mad and pissed off, they should go to the press and like expose the thing so other people wouldn't harm. But they shouldn't hate the guy if they, or the girl. If they had learned something from that teacher, they should be grateful for that, but they should re refuse to associate and support them future, you know, subsequently. And they should expose if they had harmed anybody. They should expose them. After saying that, he then said, the only guarantee of the worth of a teacher is not their pedigree, or because they're called the so-and-so, high is, is mucka muck or whatever it is, or they have the certificate from the Zen Center, or whatever it might be, you know, not just Tibetan. That's nothing. It's only whether they benefit the students or not. Whether the students get more 
on insight, whether they become happier, whether they have more compassion towards others, whether they treat other people well, whether they learn something. That's, the, that's what measures the validity of a teacher. Not that because they're called so-and-so, great, high, hoo-ha. You know, if they're harming anybody, they suck, in other words, <laughs> period. And he said that, you know, and he says it about himself. He says, you know, like, I love, that's why I love the guy. You know, I, look, one of, I'll give an example in some teaching in India, and, you know, Indians are very into bhakti of their gurus and stuff, you know, and they'll come up to you and touch your foot, you know, dust on your foot, touch it on their head, you know, they, they have that in their culture, you know. And um, he was giving a teaching to some of them about emptiness, things like this, you know. They were a little bit scratching their heads on that, but they liked it. And then he was coming to part of that particular program where he was going to introduce them to Tara, to, you know, Bodhisattva, you know, like a, like a, a deity, you know, like an angel. You know? And so he says, well, now the time has come when you, we're going to do the blessing of Tara. You know, they weren't highly developed. He, wasn't, he didn't really call it an initiation. He was just saying blessing. So then he, said, then he says, except I don't have any blessing for anybody. He said, I don't have any blessing for you. He said, they were looking like, oh. He says, nobody can give you any blessing. He says, the blessing is in you. And I can provide you an excuse to find the blessing in yourself by opening your heart and your mind to Tara. You know, he says, but I have no blessing, he says. So you know, I'm not, so in other words, he's stepping out of the role that unfortunately teachers too much get into of where they want the student to feel all beholden and dependent on them. Which, is, which leads to a lot of corruption, actually, as we have noticed, around the planet. Not just Tibetans, I mean, lots of different teachers. You know. Actually, years ago, I was at an American Academy of Religion meeting, and everybody was, and somebody, some Western theologian had written a book about all the Hindu swamis and everything, and about how they're all cults, and it was kind of a negative thing like that, and about how people who get into that yoga, and what they weren't attacking Tibetans particularly at that time, but they were attacking some swamis, you know. And I was sort of, as a professor in Asian religions, I was a little bit defending with these drunken theologians who were all railing and ranting and raving about how terrible it was that all these authoritarian personalities were being encouraged by all these cults. And that was Saturday night till late at night, because one thing those theologians do in those kind of meetings is they get highly drunk. And if you're a young professor, you have to kind of keep up with that, but you can't possibly match them. So you just keep sipping a little and pour it in the plant, you know. And uh, next morning, newspaper, this was in New Orleans, a newspaper, Jonestown. You know? So I'm sorry, I know I had a little schadenfreude, but they'd been harassing me for days. So I was kind of going around and said, oh, Reverend Jones, was he a Hindu? Was he a Buddhist? Was he, where, where, was he a Jain? Was he a Taoist? They were like, oh, they were all grumpy. They were really grumpy that their little authoritarian cult personality had a fine home in the West, you know, without any Hindus showing up, you know. I'm sorry, I know that's really bad. I shouldn't tell that. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, any question now? Anybody have any general question? I, the next thing I want to do is talk about the different things where Vimalakirti challenges lots of people, which makes it famous. But I will, I will hold that and bracket that and see if you have a question since we're getting toward the end of time. Yes? Um, it says uh, the Bodhisattva's Buddha field is the doctrine that eradicates the eight adversities. It's, a, it's what? It's the doctrine, the Buddha field is yeah. the doctrine that eradicates the eight adversities. Did you mention what the eight adversities the, it eradicates. The, a Bodhisattva's Buddha field is the doctrine that eradicates the eight adversities. Eight. Eight, eight adversities. Aversions. 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 Oh, aversions. Oh, aversions. Eight aversions. Eight aversions. Eight. Which aversion? Eight. 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 The number eight. Oh, the eight aversions. Oh, yes, the eight aversions. Yes, 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 yes. The eight adversities. Oh, I understand. The eight adversities, the eight adversities are, uh, that's a technical thing, you know, of describing a less than fortunate human embodiment, where one is, like, um, demented, you know, like blind and deaf, 
can't be educated, you know, you know, normally, except with maybe some high tech implant something in their brain, or in a culture where there's no notion of education, or where they're enslaved, or where they're born as a animal, because all humans have been animals, you know, non-human animals. That, that's not invented by Darwin. That's a very commonplace in India and Asia for ages, you know. This whole thing about being monkey, having been a monkey, it's not, a, it's not, you know, those people in Texas are freaked out with their racism, you know, about the creationism, you know, people, they don't want to be, Dar they don't like Darwin, they don't teach it, you know, in Texas, you know, because they, they want to be, those white males, they don't want to be related to other people, other races, and especially not to monkeys and dogs and cats <laughs> and cattle. The, the thing they're eating, they don't want to be related to that or have been a cow, you know. They don't want to do that. So, but in, but in Buddhist cultures, everybody knows they were animals and so forth and all many previous lives. And then human life is particularly, to get to be human is a really difficult thing, actually, from lower state. So the eight adversities are a set of adversities like that, where you couldn't possibly even think about the idea of becoming free of suffering because you're just fighting against a, t a terrible condition. So therefore, it's not the, it's called the special type of human embodiment, such as the one everyone in this room has, which is, in other words, has the access to education, has the idea they can be conscious about their life, can change themselves to be like a more free, more free of suffering, more able to help others, etc. You know, and that one is an evolutionary being in a way, and that this is the human life embodiment is the time of being able to have a huge quantum leap in evolution by becoming truly by bringing out the love and compassion and gentleness that, from Buddhist point of view, is the essence of the human being, in spite of the horrible things that humans can do because of their great intelligence. You know, they can be more evil than even, you know, the tigress only eats up one antelope at a time, you know. Human can eradicate them all, you know, with a, with a virus or something, you know. So human can be more destructive, but the nature of the human is just gentle, actually, from Buddhist point of view. Not as an absolute thing. The special virtue of human is human is highly deprogrammable and reprogrammable. That's why you can make them really nasty if you brutalize them. But they can also become saintly. If you, if you gentilize them, if there is such a word, you know. And we all have that opportunity. That's considered the virtue of the human being. So it means in a Buddha verse, the, the, there's no, all the, all the lives in a Buddha verse have the opportunity, maximum opportunity to evolve in a positive direction. And none of them are in a state where they, their life is, the, the opportunity of the human life cannot be taken fully advantage of if they decide to. That's what that means. Okay? And they say that's really rare. It's like, a, it's like a day star or something. And that's why we should really value that we have an idea of freedom, that we human beings, we are the kind of human beings that have an idea of freedom. Some people don't. They just follow in their duty, their parents or their medicine man or their war chief tell them what they have to do and they, they don't think they have any such idea. And of course, you know, Americans go on and on about freedom, freedom, but actually they're very conformist. And they're very follow the leader. Actually, we are not really highly individual. Ind Indians, I used to have a thing in my students. You think you're a rugged individual? Well, uh, try the Indian method. I tell them to try the Indian experiment. Strip naked, tie up your hair in a cow dung hairdo, paint your blue stripes on yourself, get a, get a trident staff and a begging bowl, and go down Broadway to a restaurant and demand a free lunch and see how far you get <laughs> before they send you to Bellevue and give you a tranquilizer, you know. But you have millions of them in India, even today, with even the poverty that's there after three centuries of being ripped off by the Brits and the Portuguese and the Dutch and the, and the French, you know. And uh, the, before that, uh, the, the, the Mughals, you know, the Tajik, Muslim Tajiks, you know. And uh, then they, they, they quickly realized that Americans are not quite so, so individualistic as they thought. They're very much into following their leader, you know, watching Fox News. Right? Anyway, so that's, that, that's what the adversities are. Another question. Yes. Yes. And the, the reference mm. is made that uh, the Buddhas accomplished the Buddha work by means of the four Maras and all the 84,000 types of passions that afflict living beings. 
<laughs> okay, what, what page are you on? That's uh, on page 20, page 30, 86. 86? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, it, it's the older version, your older version. Can you read it again? Where, where is it? It's a, yes, it's... What line, kind of? Well, Buddha worked by means of bodhisattvas? Yeah, in the very last sentence of the paragraph, and all the 84,000 types of passion that afflict human beings. And we're only up to DSM-5. <laughs> <laughs> my, my question is, is 84,000... Uh, That's just a symbolic number. Oh, yeah, mo oh, I see. And then they accomplished the Buddha work by means of the four Maras. So the Maras are the devils, actually. So even the bad guys are doing the Buddha's work, you know, that's... Types of passion that afflict living beings, yes. So even those energies, the Buddhas turn those to good use, in other words. They don't destroy anything. What? Yeah, well, they're Buddhists, well, you know, you can subdivide, if you analyze things, you can subdivide them in any number of things if you get more and more precise with your analysis. So the 84,000, sometimes it said there's 84,000 sets of teachings, there's 84,000 afflictions, you know, it's a, it's a symbolic number, 12 times 7, you know, 84,000, it's a very, very famous number. And uh, that just means so, so many things. And even the bad things is what he's saying, even what seem to be bad things, the Buddha can make good use of them, turn them to the benefit of being. And this is similar to to uh, what um, in the earlier ones, in the inconceivable liberation chapter, one of the one of the, the Hina, one of the individual vehicle saints says, "Oh, that inconceivable liberation teaching is really amazing and awesome that you taught, teach Buddha." But we we are, we saints are already so pure in a certain way we can't really use it. You know, we we're all burned out. You know, we have don't have that emotional energy. And he thinks that his unconscious is not still filled with these things. And he says, no. And he says, no, you can still use it. You know, it's all right. Don't worry about it. And then he even says, you wouldn't be afraid even of the devil if you did it, because you'd know that the devils are bodhisattvas in the inconceivable liberation who are putting bodhisattvas to the test. So, you know, in other words, it's like today we have, you know, our, our loss of democracy in the U.S., that we started about 40 years ago, 40, around 40 years ago, and, uh, and our pride of having won the war and being so wealthy and everything, 50s and 60s, when things were more evenly shared and we had a middle class and unions and things. And our pride of that, we've allowed ourselves to decay into an oligarchy, you know, totally. But, and so, and the oligarchy now has dropped all pretense of giving even a tinker's damn about any of us. They're just out there to wreck everything, you know. So we now are being woken up to do something about it. And Doug Jones was still elected. A guy who put the Ku Klux Klan guy in jail was elected in Alabama, rather than the guy who is an active member of the Ku Klux Klan, who was considered a shoe-in, you know. And that's because some women got out there and just didn't just sit home. And they went down and they insisted on voting. So they were kind of woken up by the devilish behavior of some people, you know, which I think all of it is happening to all of us. And it's lucky that it is happening for the planet, actually. Because we are really, you know, never mind that. So, so, so then Dimalakirti is introduced anyway. And another question. Somebody else had another question there. Yes, what's, what's that question? Yeah, perfume guy, yeah. And um, Vimalakirti tells them that uh, this planet is better because mm -hmm. it, it, you know, there's, there's something there to, to learn right. passion. Right. But when, when we say that we want to end the suffering of all sentient beings, right. I always have a problem with that idea. Uh-huh. Yes, but, but, but the point is that when you do reach the... There are, and he says they are made of light, not just perfume, lights and you know, every other kind of possible blissful celestial vision you can think of. 
That's what that paragraph that he brought up on that page 86. But Buddhahood itself, you see, the, the heavenly state, you're still isolated from other beings who are suffering. And when you get more and more powerful meditative expansion in infinite relativity, you become aware of that. And if they're further away from you, though, you might tend to lounge there in the perfume, in the perfume place, and then you would sort of stall your development. So, you know, so you to... that's the argument he's making. That because see, those bodhisattvas—he doesn't make it just gratuitously. Those bodhisattvas come because they're curious of who would send out for for takeout food. You know. Right in their universe. And then they go see this universe. And then when they get there, they think this is an awful place. Right. And then he's saying, well, yes, it has its problems here. It seems to have problems. It's purposely maintained like that. Because then this challenges the beings to be challenged by the problems. Right. And, you know, I call it, I don't know if you're familiar with theology at all, but there's something in monotheistic theology called the theodicy problem. And that's the problem of suffering if you have an omnipotent deity who created it all. So this Bhimakirti addresses what you could call the Buddha Desi problem. Because the Buddha is presented as so powerful the supernormal ability of a fully enlightened being to reshape things optimally for the student, you know, for the people who are trying to evolve to optimize their evolution. Um, but there's no, it's a, the, it's a little stronger than the theodicy because there's no claim that Buddha created the suffering in the first place. That's the problem in the theodicy thing, how they, they say, well, he wants people to learn, you know. The, the, the monotheists will say, well, God wants you to learn, so you'll be like God. And that's kind of a nice, plausible, not bad. So you have to be challenged, they're saying. It's like the, but, the, but the problem with it is if he's omnipotent, he could create you like himself right away. I mean, you wouldn't have to go through the veil of tears and suffering, you follow. So that's what leads people to feel disbelief, rational disbelief, and leads the monotheistic people, even in, in Indian monotheists, plenty of monotheism in India, and the Buddhists always critiqued that by saying, well, you can't really blame one person for creating your suffering. That makes you too weak. It, it, it doesn't make sense. We don't blame Brahma. We don't blame the Creator. Creator does it, is creative. He tries to help. But he's not omnipotent. And Buddha is not omnipotent either. But Buddha has, has discovered a path for every single kind of being to get out of the suffering and to become themselves Buddhas, equal to Buddha, and take up the Buddha job with maximal evolutionary efficacy, you could say. So it's still, well, why didn't he hurry up about it? Or what's the... What's the why is he delaying? Why are we still here struggling? And uh, then that, that you can have a kind of Buddha critique of the Buddha. I remember having it, you know, because they, they have the, the, the Buddha, in the, the Mahayana vision of the Buddha is that, so you see, when you become a Buddha, you feel you are everyone. And actually, you see everyone as already saved from suffering, actually. You see them all made of bliss energy, their bodies even. Well, every being, even like cockroach, is made of bliss. You see that, supposedly. Even beings in hell. It's a very strange idea that the, the deepest substance of the universe, the strong force, you could say, of the universe is bliss, actually. You see that. But then you see that beings don't know that. So they feel, I'm all isolated from other beings, and I'm, I'm not well made. And if someone's after me, they're trying to like to eat me or hurt me or something. So I have to fight them off. And they see them struggling. And so Buddha has a double vision where the Buddha sees them already okay. And then simultaneously sees that due to their ignorance, they don't know that they're okay. So then the Buddha's job is to try to help them find out their true nature. Do you follow? And among those who can be critical about their hard wiring, the human is the most one able to inquire into their nature and to overcome their ignorance. So the human and the, the gods are also able to do it, actually. But the gods have very little motive because they're in that incense field. They, they also have very blissful heaven. The vision of the different heavens that the Indians have is extreme and the Buddhists have is very, very elaborate and really blissful. Like Trump Tower is like a shack compared to like the... The, the divine palaces of the gods in the Indian imaginary, what we will call the imaginary of the Indians. And um, 
So they don't have the motive, they don't feel vulnerable, you know, they don't realize until they're going to die as gods that they're impermanent also and their pleasure will not last. But that, that's my question, is that yeah. if, the, if everyone did find their bliss, yeah. Well, not if you didn't know what you really are. But, I mean, if everybody did, if, if the compassion... Yeah. If, if everyone was able to find their bliss, and that bliss would be back in the perfume of heaven. Yes, it would, well, it, it, but then it, but it would, it's different from a heaven, which is separate from a hell. If, you're a, if you have a Buddha bliss, if you have a Buddha bliss, you can, uh, hell is a heaven to you, in the sense that your bliss comes there to embrace those beings and to lead them out of there. They have, you know, we have the expression, hell freezes over. <laughs> well, the, the, the Messiah figure of the Buddhist, Avalokiteshvara, which they consider to be the incarnate in the Dalai Lama, for example, or in the Karmapa Lama, or in many, many, also many females, and many beings, not just some high lama, but the, but the lama is an important one for the Tibetan in their culture. They feel that, they feel, it would be like if you had a culture in the Christian world where they felt that Jesus was always there. They weren't waiting for him to come and have a rapture and get rid of the unbelievers or something. That the, Jesus was actually, the guy in the White House was Jesus. You have a culture like that, if you could imagine what that would be like. And that's the way the Tibetans were for the last three or four hundred years, you know. And they, therefore they were totally demilitarized and they, were like, they had one million monks and nuns who were like using their life to do, and they were supported to do that, to just develop their minds. And they, it was a really wonderful society. No army. They had basically, they were vulnerable, which they got wasted in the 20th century by first the Brits and then the Chinese. But, uh, but they were happy internally because they didn't have military. In this country, like bracketing evil Putin or whoever it might be, or evil Trudeau or evil Mexicans. It's a nonsense, they're perfectly nice people. But anyway, if, they, if you bracketed that, and if all the money we put with, what was it, 765 billion in budgeted into the military, if that was all spent on education and childcare and daycare centers and making beautiful things and special things for ex-coal miners to make like beautiful widgets that could be sold everywhere, and they would have a good living, et cetera, et cetera. We would be a pretty che cheerful country, right? But they tell us, oh, if we do that, then the Russians will come, or the Mexicans, somebody, oh, I can't do that. So, so therefore, we spend all the money on things that we cannot enjoy and are only harmful to other people. So Tibet and Mongolia, which had a bigger empire than our empire, the Mongolians, they all became vulnerable and peaceful. They had a, they had a nice life for a while. Then they got sucked up into 20th century violence, you know, and, and wasted temporarily. But we'll see what happens in the future. And that's another story. So the point is, it's not a goal to become, it's considered overshooting the human form to become a god. You can. And to go into heaven, you can sort of go for a break. But the human one is the one where you both have the intelligence to rewire yourself totally. Or submit yourself to a negative wiring by watching Fox News or something. <laughs> Or Alex Jones, you can do. You can become. Everyone can become a monster, human, or everyone can become a saint. Everyone can be really happy. Everyone can become like suicidally miserable. Human being is this complete flexible thing, which is why culture, knowledge, education is so critical for human. Actually, from Buddhist view, the purpose of human life is education. Education is not so you can go and make money. Education is your evolutionary opportunity as a human being. And education is how to change yourself, right? So therefore, it's the best thing. If you overshoot toward divine, you're still very intelligent. Some bodhisattva will come and try to teach you as a divine, but then you'll say, I want a party. Like, give me a break. I'm not going to read the Vimalakirti Sutra. I don't want to hear from Vimalakirti. You know, I'm not going to meditate emptiness because I'm having too much fun. So it's a little, they have an obstacle like that, the heavens do, people in the heavens do. Until they get to where they know by their divine intelligence they're going to die, and then they can't bear the idea of going out in the in slums or something, you know, being, of seeing, of being up against suffering. So the human one is the opportunity of finding a kind of bliss that is therefore 
shared with all beings and everyone, and then gives one the ability to really effectively try to help others unravel their failure to understand their true nature. Like everybody here, their basic health is the bliss in their cells. The strong force is what really, that's your health. If you get really depressed, you'll get sick, definitely. If you start letting, telling yourself that you're really, it's really bad and it's all awful and you're hiding from people, you'll be sick. You, the bliss is right in your body. It's the health in your body. You know, it's anti-cancer in your body. It's your happiness. And then your happiness wants to flow out and be connected to others. That's the, what that study said. The person, even the guy who has like a real community down in the local bar where they're all smoking and drinking, but they're all really friendly has a better chance at longevity than the one who's super not doing anything, sitting all alone by themselves <laughs> and thinking they have connected by watching the internet and watching Russian propaganda on the internet and watching, watching the Fox News or like even, any, even the ordinary news is totally calculated to depress you. <laughs> the people who own them also own stocks in military industries. That's the biggest high value adding industry is you build big bombs and then you drop them so you immediately have to make a new one. Therefore, that's a big money-making thing in this country. And therefore, they need enemies, and they need places to drop them. And they love politicians who go and drop the biggest bomb on some field in Afghanistan. That's really great. That's wonderful. Then you have to buy another one. Right? So imagine if all of that wealth was spent helping people be happy. What would that do? We'd be, be like perfume here. It would be very nice. Wouldn't it? We have that capacity. In other words, few people go to Harvard and then they owe a trillion and a half dollars in bank loans? That's ridiculous. Everyone should be at Harvard forever. And what's Harvard anyway? You know, what is that? A bunch of snobs. Larry Summers thinks women can't count. <laughs> Do you think that's smart? He was made the president of that thing? What a moron he is. Right? What is he counting? He lost $15 billion out of, their, out of their endowment by the stupid CDOs and CDXs and all kind of weird thing him and Bob Rubin cooked up from the Clinton administration. It wrecked, our, wrecked the whole economy, those guys. They got commissions on selling them. And then they, but they're worthless, right? They're total con men. Are they in jail? No way. They're not in jail. They're out in East Hampton having their 15th trophy wife, who hates their guts anyway, and therefore, don't, they don't get real pleasure out of it. Therefore, they have to go snatch more of it because they don't know how to feel pleasure in themselves, however much money they have. Am I right? But that, they need a little Zoloft. <laughs> or they need to make breakfast for somebody. How about, I'd like to see one of them make breakfast. Would you like to have Larry Summer make you an <laughs> omelet? I would like to see him make you an omelet. I would. I'm sorry, I'm ranting and raving, but I can't help it. Because I'm a grandparent, you know. And I hate to see what they're doing to people. I really do. But anyway, you all, I see a lot of women in this room, you're going to make a difference this year, right? There's nobody not going to vote. You're going to make sure all your friends vote. And you're going to vote for nice people. And you, in, you will intuitively know who's nice and who is a BSer. And I don't mean Buddhist studies. <laughs> intuitively, we all know. Because a, a, a person who is a little happier is going to be a little nicer, you know? And that means they're a little more honest, they're a little less selfish, they have a little more friends. And those are the nice people. Right? The uptight ones who are really wretched and only do is scream anger and stir other people up. You know, they are obviously miserable themselves. We, have to, we can be compassionate for them, but in the case of being compassionate to them, compassion to them is let them do what they originally wanted, which was lose, to make more money. They didn't want the job that they can't do. They didn't want that. So our kindness to them is to help them retire. <laughs> right? Don't you think? Take a look on their face, like this. Deer in the headlights. Anyway, I'm sorry. I, I had a talk earlier today, a Valentine's Day talk, everybody, and happy Valentine, by the way, everybody. 
And the first thing I said to that group of ladies was, this is not a comb over. <laughs> well, it's thinning out. <laughs> I think they got it. They did get it. Do you have another question? Any other question? Those are the eight adversities. There are a lot of other adversities, of course. Yeah. But, you know, actually, if we learn how to do it, we can gain great advantage from adversity because we can develop patience and tolerance and strength from that. People who are too self-indulged become weakened by that, actually. And they get more oversensitive about the wrong things and they... It's a real, you know, they have old studies about happiness, you know. And like people, when they get more wealth up to a point, get happier. But then past the point, quite a middle class point, then they get less happy again. People who win the lottery usually have a really horrible time. They lose all their friends. Everybody wants something and then they run away from them. <laughs> they go hide with their winnings and, and then they lose their friends and their relatives and they feel all entitled and like, why's my cat like? And, then they go hide somewhere and they get miserable. It ruins their lives. And so, you know, the one, the point one percent or the one percent, they're not happier by having another tax cut. They may, they're more paranoid. They're more freaked out. And of course, they are in a more unstable situation where more people are annoyed with them, of course. And that's a vicious circle, you know. So the middle is really good, you know. Middle is better, being a little, little more better. And that's where people don't know these spiritual traditions, yoga, India, you know, uh, Buddhism, not just Hindu, all, all kinds of things about him, vegetarianism and Hinduism, good cooking with spices and things. This, you know, this came from a country where wealth was more widely spread. And widespread wealth people begin to learn over generations that wealth by itself will not make you happy, even if it can make you unhappy. And therefore, they developed all their spiritual skills. You know? It isn't that religion is better or anything like that. It's like their skills at using them are good. You know? You know? That's the thing. Right? Love your enemies is nice to tell you. But how do you learn to do that? That's the, that's the question, you know? How do you learn to feel compassion for your enemy? And then once you do, then how can you help your enemy stop being an enemy? Everyone thinks Jesus and Buddha were crazy to say, love your enemies. We know better. Bomb your enemies, they tell us. You know? But actually, what does love mean? Love means make the beloved happy. When you love someone, you want them to be happy. Why is your enemy your enemy? He thinks you're standing in the way of his happiness. He thinks if he can do you in, he's going to be happy, which he won't. That'll make him more happy and he'll have 10 more people to do in. So you want your enemy to be happy because then he'll stop being your enemy. It's very practical. What would make him happy? For example, Putin. He helped us have this bad government at the moment, but he wasn't the main thing. They had it rigged to start with, but still, he helped. What would make him happy, Putin? He's not happy because he has more army, he has $100 billion, you know. He lost his wife when he got $100 billion. He's got all these trophy things, you know. That's a normal affection he lost. He's all paranoid. He's got there in the Kremlin. He's going to be hitting the vodka bottle soon like Stalin, giving orders to kill people. It's really, being a dictator is one of the most miserable jobs. <laughs> it really is. You have, talk about social integration. You're terrified of your own secretary. You really, you really want to really worry about what your own secretary is going to do to you. The power is not make people happy, right? Only love makes them happy. And especially when they love someone else, not only when they're loved. That's what makes you happy, you know? That's the wisdom of the ages, you know? And you all know that or you wouldn't be here tonight, right? So I don't need to rant and rave about it. And it's 10 past 9. And uh, you're going to be unhappy if we stay too late. And so am I. And so, thanks for coming. See you later. Read the, oh, that's okay. Read the, read the Vimala Kirti. This video was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, including special tours with Robert Thurman and geographic expeditions, 
please visit TibetHouse.us. Trips in 2019 include Sri Lanka.